From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Zaxby's. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hunjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up. All right, folks, what's going on? A special edition of Wake Up War Chant. We're giving you a show on Friday. You're welcome. We're out here working all the time now that we have a sponsor, Zaxby's. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Corey here with me as well. Corey, how are you? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. I'm always good. How are you doing? I know. I'm all right, man. I am all right. Ready to ready. I want to be ready to go to Red Stick, but you're going to go to Red Stick on our behalf. But before we uh, get into Baton Rouge, let's talk to some boots on the ground. We've got Brody Miller from the New Orleans Times picking and joining us here on the program today. Brody, thanks for being here, man. Uh, how excited are you? Oh, to, thanks for to, having to, me. Yeah, man, you're going to be at the box this weekend, Super Regional Baseball, just like everybody in, at LSU sort of kind of hoped and thought was going to happen this year, right? Yeah, you know, it's kind of been a, a roller coaster to say the least because back in, you know, January, February, you know, it was it was an assumption that there'd be a Super Regional here. I mean, they were preseason number one. They they seemed to be, I mean, one of the deeper teams that they've had in a while here. Everything looked like this was a team that the expectation was always Omaha, but then one injury after another happened to that pitching staff and the team just, I mean, quite frankly, just never quite looked like a more than a top, you know, Never, never looked like a top ten baseball team all season, and that's not even just the pitching. The lineup never really looks convincing. Some guys they expected to have breakout years never really happened, and it was just kind of a you know a solid team hanging around. They they never got swept. You know they won most of the SEC series, but but they were never convincing. There was never a point in the year where this team really looked like a a contender, and then right about a week before the season ends. The pitching starts getting healthier. Some of those star freshman arms start turning it on and looking like they hoped they would. And then right at this exact time, some, some bats really woke up at the bottom of the order. So all of a sudden this lineup's deeper than it's been all season. And it, it, and it really is becoming a parody of itself, how every single season we say pulmonary's teams tend to turn it on at the last month of the year. And that is exactly what's happening. It's, the injuries are falling in line at the exact right time. And right now, this team looks the best it has all season. I'm not sure if I'm putting it in that, you know, top five range with some of those those elite teams or anything like that. But this team looks pretty tough to beat right now. You know, looking at it on paper, the teams look somewhat similar. I mean, I know they both have the same batting average practically. I think Florida State, on most metrics, though, has has the edge. They're they're more of a their slugging's higher. They're they're hitting more home runs. The only sort of decisive advantage it seems that LSU has, at least on paper, is, is the fielding. So I, I know you said things are kind of lining up, but uh, I mean, was the expectation going into Hoover in the SEC tournament that this team was hitting their stride, or are they kind of like Florida State that they that they find their groove this past weekend uh, during their regional play? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think I think they started feeling their pitching stride uh, that last weekend of the season against Auburn. That was the first time that pitching staff really looked good. And then Cole Henry, their ace, you know, he made his first return in Hoover in the SC tournament. But and I think Hoover is when this team found its stride. Uh, they they won three games. They they went 17 innings with Mississippi State and probably should have won that game and kind of handed it away. It, it was you know it's it seems like every year Palmineri's team turning on in Hoover. I think his career record there is like. 39 and 9 or 39 and 10 there I mean it's kind of absurd and this team you know the lineup it was the first time all season I was actually impressed by that lineup and I think a big part of that was you know junior college transfer catcher Saul Garza who had a lot of expectations he really started turning it on right around the SC tournament and I'm pretty sure he's 22 for 42 the past 11 games with like nine RBIs I mean it's been kind of absurd so I think once that happened, once Cole Henry got healthy, this team, yeah, right amid in the SC tournament, really turned it on. And then that whole regional, I mean, this team just looked the most convincing it's been all year. Brody, what was uh, what was wrong with Cole Henry? How long was he out? And is he back completely to 100%, do we think? Yeah, you know, uh, well, about, a, I'd say early April, you know, after the Florida game, when he was just at his peak, looked like he could be, you know, freshman of the year, all that he started feeling uh, an issue with his elbow. And, it you know, it was never anything that was, you know, Tommy John or anything like that. It was never a severe issue, but it just kind of kept irritating him for about a month. Uh, it seemed like a lot of scar tissue was built up. There's a lot of a lot of just little things bothering him, and then every time it looked like he might come back, it kind of irritated him again. But he made his return for one and two-thirds innings in Hoover, 
And that was more just about getting him out there again. And then, but the real promising thing was this past weekend, he threw five innings, you know, 80 something pitches against, uh, against Southern Miss. And it was five shutout innings and he, and he looked good. And the most promising thing about that was that his, his curveball, well, he couldn't even really find his curveball that well in that game. Cause I guess that from what I've been told, that's something to kind of take the curveball is the one thing that takes the longest to get back after an injury. And, and, he he looked solid. His fastball looked fantastic, and he got through those five innings against a pretty pretty darn good lineup. So we asked Plumineer yesterday, okay, how close is Cole Henry back to just in terms of innings, pitch count, all of that? How close is he to back to where he is? And Plumineer said he thinks that he is. He's good to go. He's good to extend it as much as he has all season. And you know, it'll be interesting to see how sharp he is because he has been rusty, but getting through it just because the stuff's so good. I'm interested to see how much sharper he is by this weekend. Will he pitch on Saturday? Do, does he know? Did he announce who's going to pitch what games? He is not. We we talked to him yesterday, uh, and he said that you know he hadn't even talked about his pitching coach because he was so you know wound up with all the draft stuff. So I'm right. sure he probably will have a better answer for us tomorrow. My guess would be Cole Henry Saturday, Landon Marceau on Sunday, and then Eric Walker if needed for Game Three. Uh, I mean, just everything Pulmonary's done these past few weeks has said that. Cole Henry's the, you know, that's his bell cow. That's the guy he's, you know, hitching his wagon to, and that's the guy he's going to go on, you know, in a, in a big game. And there's no better example of that than, than the fact that the guy had only pitched two innings in a month, and he gave him the marble game in a regional. And he, so that's if he did it then, he'll probably do it this weekend. Right. Let's wake up, board champ. Brought to you by Zaxby's. We have Brody Miller from the New Orleans Times picking and joining us here, breaking down the LSU FSU regional. You know, I think starting pitching, I think Corey would probably agree that that was the one constant strength for Florida State this entire season. It's what they've leaned on. You know, LSU has a lot of freshmen, obviously, with, with Marceau and, and Henry, like we've, we've talked about. D- does it feel like that, I don't know, Not I don't want to say beginner's luck, but does it feel like, you know, Henry and Marceau have established themselves enough that, that they're not going to shirk, I guess, in, in the big moments that lie ahead this coming weekend in Baton Rouge? Does it feel like that, Brody, that, that they've really sort of grown up here? They're no longer freshmen? Yeah, it's a fascinating dynamic because there is truth to that, I think. You know, Cole Henry's greatest strength, the reason Pulmonary gave him a weekend spot in March when the, when the staff was kind of all over the place, because Henry didn't start out in the weekend rotation. Landon Marceau was the guy, and he got really flustered at Texas and really kind of struggled to, to, handle, to handle failure, I guess would be the best way to put it. So Marceau got taken out and Henry got put in. The main reason they went to Henry in that scenario was – Cole Henry is just kind of this absurdly even-keeled, mature guy who just never gets too high, never gets too low. That is that is the reason Paul Maneri gave him that spot, and then he just ran with it. So, I mean, Cole Henry, I, I wouldn't worry about at all in that kind of setting. That's kind of his real go-to skill. Marceau, it's been really a, a roller coaster season for him because he was the most hyped of all these freshman pitchers. I mean, he was considered the most pro-ready prep arm in last year's draft and turned down, I think, $1.5 million to come here. And he went through some some real struggles here. I mean, granted, he had his own shoulder issues that, that kind of hurt him a little bit, but he, he had some tough times, and he, he will be the first to tell you. I mean, he got flustered on the mound quite a bit. He didn't handle struggling well, and he kind of had to, to, to grow from it, and I think that's been his biggest lesson this season is that now he is stronger in, in handling those things. So that, to answer your question, is probably he's the most interesting one to follow because – these last four weeks, he's pitched in some major games in the SC tournament and in, in the in a regional in the opening game. You know, he's been in some big stages and he's he's pitched fantastic lately. So it seems like he's overcome all that and that he's he's ready to go. But but he'd be the one to follow there. The the one thing that Florida State offense always does well is work pitch counts, um, especially if it's a if it's a kid that's kind of uh, well a young kid. They did it to the Georgia kid. The, the kid, that the freshman that pitched on uh, Sunday, they work pitch counts, they drive up pitch counts, they get walks, and then they'll jump on those cripple pitches. If the freshmen for LSU don't pitch all that well, maybe it's just the moment, maybe it's the offense they're facing, whatever. How is LSU's bullpen? Do they have some uh, pro arms in the bullpen? Who are their best guys back there that they'll use a lot? Yeah, I think if you ask Paul Maneri, he would say that bullpen is probably his, you know, one of the strengths of this team, and, and it wasn't always that way. But they pro arms is one thing they definitely have there. I mean, basically, what's fascinating about this bullpen is it's three. They have three guys who at different times have been their go-to closer, and they all, you know, they've they've kind of exchanged roles. But there are three guys in, in Zach Hess, Todd Peterson, and Devin Fontenot, who they at different times have been their their go-to bullpen arm, and. 
you know, Hess and Peterson can both hit 97, 98 miles an hour. They have, they have power arms. I mean, Hess turned down 600,000 last year to come back to school. And well, he fell to the seventh round this year. So that was kind of a, a disappointment for him, but he was LSU's Friday night starter to open the season and got moved back to the bullpen. So he's somebody who, you know, in a jam, he's gone five innings out of the bullpen for LSU, and he's somebody who can come in and be your, your ninth inning closer. And, and Todd Peterson was a closer down the stretch last season and parts of this season. He's somebody who also had an up and down year. He's somebody who I think he's got good stuff, but he's hittable. You know, I think he sometimes struggles with, with command, and teams can kind of can bounce off his 97 mile an hour fastball and get some big hits off him. But but he's been pitching really well lately. And then Devin Fontenot, the guy who's probably been their most reliable reliever all season, a sophomore who, you know, he throws 94, 95. He's got good stuff, and he's just somebody who kind of runs hot and cold. It'll be really streaky. So I think there's actually. They love the depth of this bullpen. They got like five or six guys I think they would genuinely feel confident turning to in a, an important situation. Like they got those three guys I mentioned. There's a lot of depth and a lot of talent there. It's just every one of those guys runs really hot and cold. So it's kind of fascinating that you never know which version of these guys you're going to get. And you saw it this weekend. I mean, in, in Saturday's game against Southern Miss, they had a, they had a four nothing lead, I believe. And, and Todd Peterson comes in in the seventh inning and, and walks the bases loaded, and so then Zach Hess comes in. And Zach Hess, it was a great pitch, but they hit it. They hit a grand slam to tie the game. I mean, it, it can just kind of run hot and cold. But there's there's a lot of talent there and a lot of arms that can definitely scare you. Zach Hess, actually, I think he had two saves in Omaha in 17. They both were against Florida State. <laughs> That's a good so, point. I forgot about that. Yeah, he's still there. And we haven't even talked about Antoine Duplantis either, the, the LSU hit king. Just a lot of interesting dynamics in play there. And Brody, we're not a really a homer show. We're pretty objective, but I think it's. You can be objective and probably say that most of the country that doesn't have a dog in the fight will probably be pulling for FSU just because of the dynamics of play with <laughs> Mike Martin uh, going for you know his first career national title and then trying to get back to Omaha. But if the baseball gods are on, on Mike Martin's side, uh, it seems like at least Paul Maneri's got a guardian angel on his side. I know it's, it's, it's been a, a, a sort of a heavy heart he's been managing this entire season after his father passed away earlier in the year, right? Yeah, and you're, you're right. There's no doubt the average fan will definitely be on Mike Martin's side. But, but yeah, it has been, it's been probably the toughest off-the-field year in Paul Maneri's career. I mean, obviously, first, just like we've already discussed, baseball season, this was a very trying season with all these injuries and all these expectations and things not going their way. But then, yeah, right in the middle of March, you know, Paul Maneri's father, Demi Maneri, Hall of Fame junior college coach, died. Uh, and, and they knew it was coming, and it was something that they'd been ready for for a while, but... I mean, Denny Maneri was no exaggeration Paul Maneri's best friend. I mean, there are a lot of close father-son relationships and whatnot, but Denny Maneri was literally the best man at Paul's wedding. I mean, he, they talked every single day about every little thing. Paul Maneri grew up in a dugout with him, and it, it hit him hard. And a lot of people were actually shocked that he actually went out and kept coaching that whole week after his father died. Sure, he wasn't as plugged in as he maybe he normally would be, but he was there in the dugout. And I mean, this has been a trying year, and I think there was – there was a month or so where I'm not afraid to say, I mean, Paul's mind seemed not elsewhere, but he seemed dejected. He seemed a little just like things were kind of wearing him down more than usual and that, I don't know, just, is, there were just other things that were bothering him more than this baseball season. I think he's in a better place now than he might have been, you know, three months ago. In the year 2021, will Jimbo Fisher be the head coach at LSU? <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as predicting it but I mean I could definitely see that scenario there's no doubt him and Scott Woodward have a lot of connections and uh, and I think Jimbo Fisher as, as you guys probably know as well as I he, he loved Louisiana and he <laughs> let's use a chop he's, he's been interested in the past so I wouldn't be surprised and, and Lord knows that Ed Ogeron's job security is always kind of up and down I think one, one rough year and his job security might be very different so I uh I won't go as far to say I'll predict that, but it's I definitely would not be surprised. Yeah, none of us would be stunned if that's the case in a couple of years. Not at all. Not at all. All right, so game one, Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central. Hopefully the weather uh, per, uh, cooperates, rather. It looks like it's going to be pretty dicey out there. Brody Miller from the New Orleans Times, picky and joining us here on Wake Up War Champ, presented by Zaxby's. Thanks for the information, Brody. Really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me, guys. It was a lot of fun. All right, so a lot to digest there. Let's do so right after this. You're listening to Wake Up War Chant, presented by Zaxby's. The universe is a big place, so you should feel especially lucky you ended up on the same planet 
with Zaxby's. And right now, we're cooking up our special Cajun Spice Blackened Chicken for our Cajun Club Sandwich and Black and Blue Salad. It's an intergalactically delicious taste experience, and you don't have to travel light years to get it. The Cajun Club Sandwich and Black and Blue Salad, only at Zaxby's. You're listening to Wake Up War Chant, all Knowles, every day. Now back to Corey and Aslan. There you go, Corey. What do you, uh, what do you think now? Yeah, man, I think, uh, I think it's going to be a tough series for the Knowles. I kind of thought that going in, but uh, yeah, sounds like it's going to be a tough. Apparently, LSU just has a whole team of guys that throw 96. I don't know. I feel like. I don't like, know how it happens, man. I don't get it. Yeah. Why, why would anybody turn one and a half down one and a half million dollars to go be a college pitcher? It makes zero sense. I get it as a position player. But, man, those arms are a valuable thing. And if you're going to blow out your elbow, you want to do it with a million and a half dollars in the bank. Well, you know, you got taxes. You got to give it to the agent gets his cut of it. So it's not really a million and a half. But what's the upside? No, I'm like, what are the chances that if you turn down one point five, what are the chances you end up being like a, a first round pick or a top 20 pick that makes it worth the two years that you didn't play college, you didn't play pro baseball, you're two years farther removed from getting to the major leagues. What, mu- How much money would you have to get paid in two years to make turning down 1.5 reasonable? Well, you Six get, million? Eight yeah, million? I, I don't know. Well, you get that degree. You're around prettier women. Well, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not a bad life playing ball at no, Florida State No, it's not just LSU. as a pitcher. Like, as a pitcher. Like, I think all position players should go to college. But as a pitcher, man, it's so it's so hit and miss whether you're going to need whether you're going to be able to throw when you're 25 years old. Just all the arm injuries that we have, it is such a risk. You would think, man, go get paid, go get professional coaching, and maybe they can take care of your arm a little better. I don't know, just my thought. I mean, obviously, we all know I'm going to have this dilemma in about seven years, right? Right. With what we're going to do with Brady, because I, obviously, I'm going to want him to play for Mike Martin Jr. Mm-hmm. But if he's a pitcher. Would you know, and, and he's probably going to be one of the top picks in the draft. The only way he's playing at Florida State is I'm going to have to tell me, and I'm like, look, first two years he's not pitching at all. You're going to put him in center field and let him bat third. Junior year, he can be your closer. Okay. Then we'll go from there. Kind of like not, the J.C. Flowers. I'm not, I'm not killing his arm. Right. The J.C. Flowers plan. Center field. Exactly right. Yeah. But J.C. Flowers always batted eighth until this year. Brady Clark, even if he's hitting uh, 080, I'm going to have a contract that says he bats third. How wild is it that quite literally J.C. Flowers was an auto out in Omaha two years ago, and now he's emerged as one of the more reliable guys in that lineup. Plus, he obviously can can throw the ball quite well off the hill. I mean, it's testament not just to that he was me. an auto out. His slugging percentage was like under 300. Like he had four extra base hits for an entire season or six or something like that. Ridiculous. And now he's, what, second in the team in home runs? He's got 13? I mean, he's a legitimate power bat too. It's, um, yeah, it's been a pretty remarkable turnaround. I, I, I had no idea. I didn't even know this was possible. I didn't, I didn't see this coming at all from a kid that I would guess his first two years might have had 15 extra base hits total, maybe 18, 20, somewhere in there, and now his junior year he has 13 home runs alone. Like it's a, been a, um, a really just extraordinary turnaround from a guy that was not good at all his first two years. To turn into now, look, he's not a great hitter, but he is a productive hitter now, and he's hit some big, big home runs for them and had some big hits. Uh, good for him, man. What it's a um, testament to him, a testament to the, I guess, meat and working with him, but you know, more than anything, a testament to JC to, to concentrate and focus on getting that much better. I feel encouraged after talking to Brody Miller, though, from the New Orleans Times Picayune. I just think that, if, and, and really looking at the numbers, I know that's lazy, but. LSU has got nothing to hang their hat on other than their fielding. I mean, their their slugging is subpar. Their, um, you know, they they don't they don't get freebies. They don't they don't wait out at bats the way Florida State does to to make teams really have to go deep into their bullpen. Uh, you know, they they've had their struggles. I mean, and not to say that Florida State hasn't, but I think the fact that they've got freshman pitchers, which you know we saw that work out well for Florida State in in twenty twelve. Parrish was a freshman out in Omaha in 17. Did I think did he start against Fullerton to keep the the season alive after that LSU game? That sounds right. You right. put me on the spot, I but it sounds like uh, he that 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 feels right. Let me put it that way. Okay. But I don't. That's know all that, that matters. For sure. You know, we don't. You know, we want to be factually correct on the show, but as long as things feel right, we're going to keep <laughs> rolling with it. Yeah, good. But, good. 
and I think, you know, Cole Henry obviously coming off an injury, and yeah, he's on the mend. Marceau, I mean, he's he's put together like five good starts. That to me still doesn't feel like a complete body of work. We'll see how, what the weather's going to do to the game. I mean, I think that probably would be the advantage for LSU if there's going to be rain delays and the, the bullpen is going to be more of a factor because obviously they've got more options there. But in terms of team outlook, team sort of identity or, or momentum going right now, it's just hard to think the Florida State's not going to to find a way to get two more wins out there. And and on practice Wednesday, and you know, we, we spoke about it earlier in the week, like they're just it just feels like a naturally loose team. It's not a facade. You know, Tyler Holt was was making fun of Drew Parrish for not having the right hat on and uh, you know, being like, Oh yeah, so you got drafted by the by the Royals. Good for you. He was making fun of JC Flowers. Like, yeah, have fun in Pittsburgh, man. Uh, you know, right. everyone's like laughing and, and, and ribbing and, and joking back and forth and you know, eleven seems dialed in. I just there's just I don't know. Yeah, the, the romanticism of baseball has brought me back. There's there's something about the sport that you can you can fall back in love with it even after you sold all your stock. So, uh, yeah, man, just you know, screw you, Paul Maneri. You've 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 ruined Mike Martin's career enough. Twenty you know two thousand two in Notre Dame, you come down here and yep. derail a sixty win team from making it to Omaha, and then seventeen obviously taking Florida State down both times at the College World Series. So you've had your ring. It's eleven's turn. Hashtag one last ride. I think it's uh, it is encouraging that to me anyway to to know that they're they're counting on a couple of freshmen um, to start uh, in. Look, they might be awesome. They might a kid, you know one kid hasn't he he hasn't thrown more than five innings apparently in two months, um, and I'm sure he's got electric stuff when he's on. But so did the two guys that that Florida State faced in Athens, and that's another thing that's encouraging. Nothing they'll see in Baton Rouge will be different than what they saw in Athens, and they handled that with velocity. Um, you know, although the crowd obviously will be different, but the velocity, the stuff, they've already seen um, two pretty electric guys, two guys that will be getting probably paid a lot of money to pitch in a few years if their arms are still intact. They saw that this past weekend, so they're not going to be scared or back down from these two freshmen that LSU has. That's encouraging that they're both freshmen. I am interested to see because the Georgia freshman didn't handle it well at all. Like he just kind of got a bit rattled. And so did the Hancock kid on Saturday night. He got rattled by the Florida State offense. It's a it, one through nine. It's a pretty tough lineup. They're all they're all willing to walk if you let them. So it's a it can be a tough lineup to pitch to at least now here lately. But they do have arms in the pen, and so it's not the normal. It's not a normal situation where you would go into a game and said, "All right, let's get to their pen. Let's get to their pen." They got some pro guys back there. They can throw just as hard. So that's the discouraging thing. Like it's not like you get into the meat of that bullpen and you're going to feast, typically. But, but don't you think, so, Corey, though, that that that'll make Florida State more apt to being aggressive? I mean, I don't think they went into the Georgia. I mean, did they go? They went to the Georgia game being aggressive. Was that so they could knock the starting the starting pitcher out of the game and bring the bullpen? It just felt like they were just going to capitalize on on what was given to them. No, what they did, what Florida State did wonderfully against Georgia is they swung at all the fastballs that were over the plate and they spit on all the breaking balls that weren't. Like, you just didn't swing at them. And I think those guys were getting used to getting a lot of swings and misses where they're breaking stuff. And I don't know if they couldn't, find the, they couldn't find it, they couldn't throw it for strikes, but Florida State was like, man, if you're not going to throw that pitch for a strike, we're not swinging at it. And they didn't. So they had to throw fastballs. And that, they weren't, yeah, they, I don't think they went into, especially that Saturday night game, they were aggressive early. It's the first good fastball they got they were swinging at. And I think that's what the mindset will be. This kid, either one of them, if they can't throw their breaking stuff for strikes, they're going to have to throw a bunch of 2-0 fastballs or 3-1 fastballs, and that's how you get lit up. Like, I don't think Florida State's going to go into there saying, all right, let's just work as many walks as we can. It's no, let's just swing at good pitches. That's very frustrating for kids that can't, if they can't throw their breaking ball for strikes, and the only way they can throw strikes is fastballs, and they don't get any swings and misses on pitches out of the zone, that gets really frustrating. Yeah. So that I think that's the plan. I think that's probably always the plan. Um, and we'll see how those freshmen handle it because I, I don't know that they faced a lot of offenses like this that walk as much and drive up pitch counts and you know typically only swing at good pitches, at least here the last four games, uh, as this team does. And last question I, I want to ask you before we, we break for the weekend and you go out to Baton Rouge. I still have supreme faith in Drew Parrish. Now, I think I don't. I still think he hasn't even like put together his best game of the season. But I think it's still on the cusp. Even though, you know, FAU took him deep. I mean, like you mentioned, it was it was like one pitch 
um, and, and the ball is flying out of that park. So I still have total faith in Drew Parrish. But, you know, the way I look at Landon Marceau for LSU, I just feel like that's too small of a sample size to think that the kid's found his stride now and, and is just rolling and, and, and can't be stopped. Like C.J. Van Eyck, he's put together, I don't know, like eight, seven straight starts where he's been pretty phenomenal. Are you more of the belief that that is – that's just the way this kid's going to be playing the rest of the season, however long it lasts, or uh, he's due to maybe have uh, a setback. Like, how do, how do you approach things when you look at it? I don't know, maybe not even so much from being a journalist, but as like a fan. Yeah, I mean, I you know, the caveat is it's always baseball. Things can happen. But no, man, I think this is who he is. I, I don't, you know, I think it's been six or seven straight really promising starts. Um, I think last year that kid was at the end of the year. Him and Parrish were awesome. He was a great pitcher at the end of the year. He didn't get to pitch in the regional uh, for reasons we don't need to get into, but he didn't. Um, but, yeah, man, I, I think that guy is who he is. I think he's a uh, competitor. I think he's got really good stuff. I think the Georgia coach afterwards said as much. He's like, we knew Van Eyck was good. We knew he was filthy. He can throw a fastball in the low to mid-90s, and he's got a great curveball, and we knew it. And he'll throw it at any count. And that, you know, Van Eyck's the real deal. Like he's, you know, we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens in the summer going into next year, but he's a high draft pick. If he keeps pitching like this, if he pitches like this next year, he's got, he's got frontline stuff. So I, I think that's who he, and he's got the mindset to deal with it. You know what I mean? He's, he doesn't back down. He doesn't shrink from moments. He's never pitched in an environment like this. Like we, we believe, I feel that Drew Parrish is pitched in Omaha in an elimination game. I feel it in my gut. But we know that C.J. Van Eyck has never pitched in front of 14,000 people. He's never been on a stage like this. But I also think he's got the exact mindset that it won't bother him. I think he might be one of those kids that enjoys pitching in a hostile environment and shutting up a crowd, which means he'll probably give up 13 runs. Who knows? Can't predict baseball, Aslan. You know what I mean? I but that I, I, I think you're more confident in him uh, than anybody else on your staff, the way he's pitched um, in the last six or seven starts of his season. Drew Parrish went five and one third against Fullerton. He was charged with all four runs that Fullerton scored. So, okay, kind but of I, half I right. Think, I feel like he did all right. You know, I Chase. Like, I, you that know doesn't Chase, sound like a really good game, but for some reason, I feel like maybe he came out of the game when they it was they only had one or two runs, and then the guys came in and let in a couple more. Right. But I feel like he got a big ovation as he walked off the field. Might have been just he's a freshman too. I mean, to be put could in that have been spot. yeah, and he kept him in the game. Sure. Yeah. Did you know Chase Haney threw in that game? He that actually got right. the win. They had a righty up. He yeah. came in and faced a righty. I don't remember that. Yeah, he was credited with the win. Drew Carlton I remember got Mendoza the save. hit a home run. I remember that as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. What was the score? 6-4. Six, 6-4. Four. Six, four. Suck on that, Titans. Are they the Titans? <laughs> yeah. What's Cal State Fullerton? Correct. Yeah, they're the Titans. You're right. Nailed it. Nailed, Nailed it. it. They used to be great at baseball. I say that they were in the College World Series just two years ago, yeah, but when Florida um, State was there, they used to be every year. They were awesome. Yeah, Augie was there. I think wasn't Augie Garrido? He was there before he went to Texas. Yeah, yeah, and they won championships. And they like Dave old Serrano. Augie doggy. Yeah, they were good. Do you want to? Uh, you haven't done it in quite a while. I mean, do you want to coach us up as we head into the weekend? No, avoid the weather. Try not to drive when it's really raining and storming. And I'll be in uh, Bat Baton Rouge. There we go. Eating gumbo yes. etouffee. Yes. Jambalaya. Yes. Uh, what's another uh, Cajun cuisine? A po' boy. I don't know. That's all I A got. Po' boy. Okra. Did I say etouffee? You said etouffee. I love etouffee. me some etouffee. And uh, probably go listen to some Cajun music and just live it up in Baton Rouge and maybe scout neighborhoods for where Jimbo can be there in a couple years. What what neighborhood Jimbo's going to live in. He's Corey Maslow. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend, everybody. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news. Stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.